You're listening to the Work Cultured Podcast, where good companies keep good company. Well, welcome to the Work Cultured Podcast. We have with us today, Bob Smith of Bridgepoint Consulting. Welcome, Bob. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's nice to, nice to have you here. At the time of this recording, uh, for those listeners, if you hear some sniffling, we are in Austin, Texas, and it's right in the midst of all the cedar uh, fever. And so, th- you know, excuse any sniffles that you might hear. <laughs> it's uh, the struggle's real right now. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the, uh, it, it, we're, we're playing again for, the, I guess, the third time uh, during the season, the is it COVID game? <laughs> Every time a, a sneeze or a cough or anything like that happens. Uh, but okay, so this is going to be fun because uh, Bob has actually retired from the company that he was a co founder of. And so it'll be the first time to talk to somebody who's like, started the company, ran it for a very long time, exited. Uh, and I, you know, so I want to ask you some questions about successor and things Sorry, like that, but also, you know, culture building when you were involved and kind of culture overseeing as a principal afterwards. That's gonna be a really fun conversation. Good. Uh, but t- give me just a quick brief, quick and dirty of Bridgepoint of your role. Uh, just, yeah, the story up to now. Okay. Well, so Bridgepoint consulting has been around now, 25, 20, we started in 99, so 24 years, I guess. Um, And the initial, the initial focus was helping companies handle their accounting and finance. So we were initially started on, uh, focused on startups that needed a chief financial officer or or needed a controller, Mm -hmm. but they didn't need him or her 40 or 50 hours a week. They needed them. (laughs) four hours a week or sure. eight hours a week. Yeah. And, and so we started building a team of people that we could put into these uh, companies on that fractional basis. Uh, so that was way back in, in the dot-com bubble days mm-hmm. for those of you who are around, have been around that long. Yep. <laughs> yep. And uh, from there we grew uh, started working with larger middle market companies on projects. If they had an acquisition they were going through, if they had an unexpected resignation, if somebody mm-hmm. went out on maternity leave or other medical leave and they couldn't leave that position vacant for that period, we could parachute one of our people in there on a full-time basis. Uh, we, we subsequently got into IT consulting, which is really now one of the fastest growing parts of our practice, uh, and, and has really become a significant, uh, a significant, and that, that practice is focused nationwide. We've worked oh, wow. with clients everywhere from Boston to Seattle, to Canada, to, you know, and, and even done some projects internationally, uh, working with them. And we ended up selling the company. I had six partners at the time. Well, or I had five partners. There were six of us that, that were partners and owners in the business. Uh, and we ended up selling the business in 2017 to a group out of Chicago called okay. the Addison Group. Um, Which I've and, heard of. Uh, yeah. And then I stayed on for a couple of years afterwards to transition. Uh, and we had an earn out going that I wanted to, to help do what I could to, to yep. maximize the earn out portion. Yep. And then retired. Uh, in January of 2020, just in time for COVID. Just in time. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So you sold the company and you stayed on for quite some time uh, and you're still considered a principal. Is that right? Well, no, I'm, I, I have no official involvement. I am still ah, an, okay. an ambassador. My, I think my title is technically principal emeritus. Yeah. Uh, okay. But, okay. But anytime there's any work that needs to be done, that... I passed the ball really fast yeah. to somebody else. Right. Uh, How many employees did you have when you sold? So when we sold, we had almost 200. Wow. Uh, when I started in 2001, it, it, we had six or eight people mm-hmm. uh, on the team. 
Uh, and that was just as the dot com bubble was bursting. Yep. And you know there weren't many startups around at that point. Um, so you know got very very fortunate that first of all we were in the right place. Mm-hmm. And we were offering I think the right kind of service, uh, and we were able to attract uh, great great people uh, and build a team. And I was able to to uh, you know attract great partners to join me. Uh, and, and help run the business. That is super cool. Now, so I have so many questions to, that we'll get to, but I don't, I want I don't want to go too far without asking the first question, which obviously is not the first question, but we tend to ask every guest the same question kind of right out of the gate, just to get the vulnerability flowing and, and, and see where it goes from there. So the question is, what is a mistake that you've made in leadership that you'll never forget? <sighs> You know, there, there are, there are a lot of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that's usually the, <laughs> you, you mean just one? Is that yeah. what you, <laughs> um, and, and I guess I'm trying to think of one that, 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 that really stands out. Yeah. Um, and any maybe that pertain to culture and just the people aspect of, of, of leadership. Yeah. <sighs> You know, I think, and, and maybe it sticks with me because it's one of the most recent. Um, I think, in a lot of ways, I overstayed my welcome, so to po- speak. Yeah, post sale or even before? Well, post or just running the business. Okay. Okay. You know, I had never run anything near that large, mm-hmm. uh, and and we were getting diverse, um, and y- y- you know part of the reason, part of the reason that we sold the business, part of my reason mm-hmm. for wanting to sell the business, was I realized we needed to go through uh, a, a management transition, okay, and. Um, you know, frankly, there were going to be some challenges getting all the partners yep. to agree on what those next steps were. Mm-hmm. Um, and because we had we had always run the business um, where it was kind of pretty much one partner, one boat kind of deal. Yeah, you, you know where where it it was. Everybody, you know, was involved. Um, and, and, and it wasn't that I, you know, had this iron fist trying to run the business. Um, and, and so making that transition was going to be a challenge. Uh, and, and that was frankly, one of my motivations for, for doing a transaction was, um, to, you know, the, the buyer obviously was going to have a huge say in, yeah. in, in what direction that went. Um, and, and I'm ecstatic to say that, that five years later now, uh, the, the, the business is going incredibly well. They've almost doubled revenues in those wow. five years. Um, the, the group that bought us, and I've told the CEO of, of, of Addison this, I cannot imagine a transaction having gone better and having and, wow. and that we could have found a better partner. Five years after being acquired, Addison has still not moved a single individual into our business. That's incredible. To to you know help us run <laughs> it. Uh, you know they 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 listen. They help when we need help, um, and and. My existing part, you know, the partners that I had are still there running the business. And, and, and it was and then the whole back to your original mm-hmm. question. Uh, I knew it was time, if you will, for the next generation mm-hmm. to take the business and take it in their direction. You know, I was an old dog and it was hmm. getting harder and harder to treat teach this old dog new tricks interesting uh but we needed we you know it it was time for 
for for for more fresh thought uh I don't know that I could have managed through COVID. Yeah. Okay. You, you, Interesting. You know? um, what do you think those challenges would have been? Well, I'm a people person. Okay. So okay. this whole, like just the immediate, everybody's remote. Nobody's in the office anymore. That would have been a big change. Yeah. I, that would have years been of- <laughs> a huge change. A Zoom happy hour? I, right. I don't even understand that. <laughs> yeah. and, and yet... Our folks were doing them. They've they haven't had a whole lot of turnover. They've done a fantastic job um, of working through all those challenges. Luckily, our technology was pretty much set yeah. up for remote, so that we, we didn't have a lot of work to do in that area. That's good. But but you know, one of the challenges of our business has always been, you know, we hire a great staff. And they can go out and work in a client's offices for two or three years mm-hmm. on a project. Yeah, they're not even your employee really anymore. <laughs> how, how do we make them feel like they're part of the Bridgepoint team and not part of ABC company? Mm-hmm. And when you're 100% remote, that just magnifies yeah. that challenge. Um but but our team has done a fantastic job of that. It would have been a monumental struggle for me, uh, I think, because I'm I'm kind of a managed by walking around person. Drive by, and kinda, yeah. It, yeah, you know, you go in the office. We got this twenty thousand square feet of office space, and there's ten people, twelve people in the office, and it, it, it kind of feels like a morgue. Um, and and that would be a a challenge for me yeah. to deal with. So I think you know we've worked through it fantastically. Could we have done an even better job if I had left a little earlier? Maybe. Okay. Um, and, and, and so I think that's you know one of the the <laughs> when it's your baby, yep. it's it's not easy to yeah. uh, to. To, to leave it, and, and I think in some ways, COVID may have helped me through that process because it was such a dramatically different time. You're probably going, you know, I'm yeah. glad I'm not, yeah, no, around as much anymore. <laughs> Absolutely, a- absolutely, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so much to unpack there. First of all, really happy to hear that there's a good acquisition, that the transition was good. Um, I'm still in battles with what I thought was going to be a perfect buyer for my last company, but they ended up buying three other companies at the same time and flipped us all to the literal largest company in the world that did what we did. And it hosed everybody. I mean, they just fired everybody. Um, the earn out, not getting it at all, uh, because they lost all of our clients. And I mean, so it was just the completely opposite of what you're talking about. We got hosed. And that is more often the story. It is. Than, than, than what we experienced. And you probably know that and, even more because you, you started doing oh, financial, you're, you're doing yeah, financial advising and consulting. we work on that all the time. You're doing right. M&A all day long probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wish I would have known what I didn't know, but hindsight's twenty twenty, and yep. you, know, you want to trust people. You want to believe that people are telling you the truth, especially when they're acting so excited to have you on board and all the synergy they're talking about. Yeah, but... Yeah. The yeah. almighty dollar wins. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, 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 you know, the, 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 the may, maybe one little anecdote to sort of articulate what a, what a great match it has been. Um, the gentleman that's now pretty much running Bridgepoint, uh, you know, called the, called the Addison CEO, uh, I don't know, March or April of 2020, once we saw our business dropped. 30 or 40% Yuck. in a couple of months. And and we're a people business, okay? Yep. And so he calls the, the the CEO and said, you know, man, this is this is looking kind of ugly. Um, do I need to be putting together a list of people to lay off yeah. or furlough or you know whatever? Yeah. Um and and to his credit, the CEO said absolutely not. I think this thing is going to be short-lived, and I want us positioned really well 
to, to, to come back really strong yeah. once it comes back. Uh, and, and, and assuming and so, it has. Yeah, and, and it has, and, and, and again, it, it, it's been good for us. Um, but, you know, he was willing to, to sort of take the hit in the short term of con- <coughs> excuse me, continuing to pay people that weren't working very much yeah. uh, to, to make sure we had those resources here and available um, when things kicked back off. Uh, and, and they started seeing things kick back up, you know, in the fall of 2020. Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of the projects that got canceled were mm-hmm. restarted yeah. and then once companies had kind of understood what was happening and then gotten their yep. new footing and all that jazz. So, yeah. Uh, wow. That's yeah. big stuff. <laughs> that, it's, it's so good to hear too, taking care of people, putting them first. And I'm sure that, you know, that, that CEO of Addison had to take a financial hit himself, but was willing to do so. Uh, coming back to the way you're, you're answering that question about, you know, maybe perhaps you should have stepped out a little sooner. If you were to like, if you were at a 30,000 foot view, another company somewhere else. And of course, every company is different, but so there's no, there's no timeline. You can't say, well, after 12 and a half years, that's when you should start thinking about, you know, a successor. You can't do that. But are there other indicators that you can think of? If you were giving advice to a founder of a company that had been doing it for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, are, can you think of some signs that they should look for in themselves to say, Hey, maybe it's time that I bring a successor in and get some new blood, some new ideas generating. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think some of the things that that I begin to to feel and sense, um, you know, the primary way I and we built the business in the early days was with relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, I was fortunate that I had been in Austin. Um, and had relationships with, with a lot of, of the CFOs around town and the controllers. Um, and you know, what was, they had for reasons that I'm not sure I'm clear on, but they had confidence. If I said we could do something, we could do it. Yeah. And, and so they were, they were great about, you know, when they had needs and, and that, that, our skill set, you know, could help, um, turning it, you you know, hiring us for those projects. Well, you know, again, I'm a very relationshipy kind of person. And and I think in some ways the business has gotten big enough. And as we started going to new cities, okay. Mm -hmm. We open an office in Houston, and we open an office in Dallas, and we've opened an office in Denver. Well, we don't necessarily have relationships in that places. Right. So there were other ways mm-hmm. that we needed to go market and, and generate business. Um, and, uh, again, I, I was just so accustomed to doing it through relationships yep. that, that, you know, I was less adept at being helpful in those situations. Uh, and, and as you know, I, I think as they're operating today, again, a, a lot of the business is not necessarily coming through those kinds of relationships. And, and mm-hmm. so we needed to morph how we were marketing and, and generating business. You know, so, to, so for you, that was an, that was one indicator. You're like, okay, just the way we even generate business and grow this thing has shifted. And it's, it's something now that isn't my wheelhouse. It's yeah, not my strongest exactly right. suit. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And I can see that that could be the case with, you know, any aspect of the business. Um, I mean, you obviously on this podcast, we talk about culture a lot and I, I have a kind of, I don't even know, know how to phrase a question exactly, but you know, as time, it goes on and as we you know grow as a culture certain words certain ideas come to the forefront of our consciousness and this term company culture and i don't remember existing even 10 years ago right so it's always been important there always has been a culture but we didn't have that language that was at the forefront and so i'm curious when you you know going back to dot com era and you're 
in this company and in this leadership, was culture at the forefront of your mind or was it like, how did that look and feel differently to how it does today? Well, I, I, I agree with you. There was certainly less focus on the, the cultural aspect of your company. Mm -hmm. Um, I still think, you know, sort of subconsciously it was important. Sure. Um, you know, it, it was important to us in, in several different ways. Um, how we treated our clients and how we dealt with issues with our clients, um, you know, challenges that they were having and, and that kind of stuff, as well as attracting people. You know, our, our biggest challenge forever almost has been hiring enough people. Yeah. The really good kind of people that 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 we want and that are going to make great consultants. Yeah, not just uh, the quantity of them, but yes. the, like who they are, whether they fit in the, the right org. kinds of yeah. skill sets and the right kind of attitudes and all of that jazz. Um, and <clears throat> so, being able to not only attract those people but retain those people, yeah, uh, and, and 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 keep them happy and challenged and, and motivated and compensated and all of those pieces. Um, uh, I, I remember, um, during the 2008, 2009, yeah. um, you know, downturn, uh, and, and again, you know, our business, yep. um, the, the fourth quarter of 2008, it was like an avalanche, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and I remember talking to a number of our team and, 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 and sort of trying to inform and counsel them a little bit to say, you know, Hey Sally, uh, I, I don't see any work for you. And, 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 and our model back then was when you worked an hour, you got paid for an hour. Okay. And so right. if everything's you were not, yeah, yeah. If you were not working, we were not paying you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, having this conversation with Sally and, and sort of saying, I, I, I don't see anything on the horizon where there's going to be a project for you. Yeah. And so please, you know, does it make sense for you to, 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 to start looking for a job elsewhere? Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the outcome of that conversation much, many more times than I would have thought was, Hey, Bob, thanks. Um, you know, I can make it a couple of more months and I like working at Bridgepoint and yeah. I want to try to do this and I want to try to make it work. So I'll, I'm going to hang in. Yeah. I, I'm going to hang in when I really would have thought, you know, their response would have been. Okay, and, and and part of what I was talking to them was anything I can do to help, you know, reference whatever. Sure, uh, let me know, and I will I will do that. Um, and and you know, but folks enjoyed working with us. Yeah, um, and you know, would hang in there longer than I might have given them credit. Um, uh, to, so, to sub, help to make it work subconsciously like you said there was something going on you, you guys always knew we had to take care of our people and and you were doing something that was creating an environment that even when there's no work and people literally aren't even getting paid they still want to stick around they want to be part of what you had built um that's that's really wonderful can you if you can you look at or point to any like big key factor that you think contributed to that well, part so so part of our model, I, I you know I mentioned a, a, a little bit of it a second ago, where you know if you're working, you get paid. But part of the quid pro quo in that understanding with that employee was when we had a project, we would call them and describe the project and, and tell them as much as we knew about the project, how long it might last. 
how many hours a week or days a week, whatever, what kind of work would they be doing? Where was the company located? What did the company do? Who would they mm-hmm. be working for? You know, all of that stuff. Uh, and the employee had the, the, the opportunity to say, opportunity to say, no, thank you. You know, if we had an employee that lived up in Cedar Park and the company was located down in Buda yeah. and they only wanted her one, you know, one day a week, um, you know, you could see how that might not totally make sense mm-hmm. for that individual. And they had the opportunity to say, no, thank you, Bob. I, this doesn't seem to make sense to me right. or, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, and, and, and so we... You know, part of that quid pro quo of only paying them when they're working was they had the opportunity to to say yes or no thank you um, on various projects. And I think that was a, a, a real – people enjoyed being able to have that kind of input on yeah. what was going on. You know, we had some people that, hey, during the summer when my kids are out of school, I'd like to work less hours. Yeah. And we could try to, you know, work with them – and 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 back their hours back uh, in the summertime and that kind of stuff and, and that's awesome make that because that's that's pretty recent that it's almost a requirement now like yeah. if, if a company wants to attract good people and they don't have flexibility in their schedule and work life balance and all that I mean forget about it you're yeah. just not going to get good people um, you know but certainly in you know the early two thousands late two thousand you know two thousand ten era like you know, people weren't really doing that they weren't letting people take a lot more time off in the summer, you know, to be with their kids and things like that. So that, you know, you were ahead of the curve. Yeah. And, and we could make it work because if they weren't working, we weren't paying them for those hours. And, 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 you know, part of the challenge when you have people on a salary and they're less working less than a full time, you know, if they want to work 30 hours a week and Mm -hmm. they're on a salary, you know, okay. We back off the salary some, but you kind of expect them. And if they only are working 25 hours, are you feeling like, wait a minute, this isn't a fair deal? Or if they're working 35 hours, are they kind of going, wait a minute? Yeah. And whereas we, every hour you work, we, we paid you. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, 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 we didn't ever have to have any of those kinds of conversations mm-hmm. around, wait a minute, you're not working enough or or you're working, you know, or the person saying I'm working more than kind of what you're paying me for and all of that jazz. Yeah. And and now people are on salary. I mean, I'm not necessarily bridge point, but just in general, you, you've got salaried folks that are expected to get the work done. And now that's, what's being focused on. Like what is the quantity and quality of work that is expected from you? And if it takes you 25 hours, great. You you have a nice week, but if it takes you 45, it's going to take you 45. And, And there there's, this, now this is balance, this ebb and flow, give and take, where the company comes out ahead, the person comes out ahead, and it seems to be this balance that as long as that employee is kept happy and you know, the employer is seeing production, profits, et cetera, there's now a flexibility that exists that I, you know, I certainly never saw you know, a decade, two decades ago. Uh, and it's really interesting to see. And I think it's a really fascinating shift that's happened. Yeah. And, 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 you know, now, particularly with all the remote working, you know, how do you, manage, you can't even know, yeah, yeah. you know, what, what that, uh, what all that person's doing and, and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, A lot more trust is required yeah. nowadays. Yeah. And, uh, I've actually seen the opposite, uh, where it's, you know, been less trust. And so companies will install spyware on their employees' computers for the working at home. And I'm like, nah, I think you missed the point. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work out for you very well. <laughs> Yeah, the tracking your keystrokes yeah, and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, when, when it's, it's a challenge. When it's billable hours, uh, you, did, did you feel like, that, so, so, you know, trust plays a huge role today in, in the environment where salaried folks are, you know, working flexible hours. But when, it, you, you know, when you're paying what you're billing, it's like almost a one for one relationship. Right. So like, did you, did trust even feel like it was something you had to deal with or was it just implied? You know, it was pretty much implied and in, in, in a lot of ways, you know, we kind of relied on our clients, 
You know, if if, sure. if Jim says he worked 20 hours this week on that client and, you know, we bill the client in 20 hours and they're, they're comfortable that they got 20 hours because, you know, part of it's in the office. And so yep. obviously that's easier to see. But over time, more and more of our folks, even pre-COVID, were, were working remotely and being yeah. able to, to, you know, do all the work from their house or the coffee shop or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but, it, you know, in that regard, we, we kind of relied to some degree that the, that the clients didn't, weren't asking questions. So yeah. they felt comfortable. Yeah, no news they is got good news. 20 hours <laughs> uh, worth of work. Yeah. And uh, I always wonder what, what attorneys do. I'm still dealing with my M&A attorneys and they send me a bill and I'm like, what? How, how did you work that many hours? Well, I don't know if I even believe you. There's my voice almost going yeah. away with all this yeah. cedar. <clears throat> <Yeah>. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry, I'm coughing no. right into the microphone. <laughs> okay, so um, did, when, when you were around, so I, I have the company core values pulled up right now as they stand today. Okay. Were those in place when you were around, or is that something that you think um, that um, Addison Group kind of came in and... No, we had, we had the core values um, probably... You know, the last five, seven, eight years. Okay. Uh, so, you know, starting yeah. around 2010 or 2011 what inspired, or something like what that. What inspired that to like kind of bring those forth? Well, again, th this, this was some input from my partners, yeah. younger partners, um, uh, that, that they felt like we needed to, 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 to be more overt. Mm -hmm. about those uh and and articulate them and 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 try to emphasize to our people uh what those values were um but in my mind that was primarily just quantifying and articulating what we'd been doing. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't have to come up with values that all of a sudden you'd have to focus on. Yeah. You were, you were putting to words what already existed. Yes. Yeah. What yeah. we had been doing and what we'd been living with, uh, and living by, yeah. so to speak. I hear that quite a bit. Uh, interestingly, the company I was with had been around for 34 years before I joined, had no mission, vision, values, anything like that. Uh, in fact, it was run. I culture wise really terribly <laughs> just treated people horribly. And so that when we had to come up with core values, we had kind of turned over almost the entire executive team by that point. And we, we had kind of had to start from scratch. Like we don't, we don't really have anything we see in the organization that we want to lift up and put words to. We actually need to revitalize this whole thing. Uh, so it's really interesting because some, uh, I, you, you approach core values from sometimes you, they're already there. You give them words. Sometimes you have to revitalize. Um, and it's just always a fascinating thing to look at organizations and see which, angle they have to take. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you feel any resistance doing that exercise with your other partners? No, I, yeah. uh, you know, and, and again, I think many of them were already thinking in that context. Yeah. And, and, you know, I was absolutely fine with it. You know, where I would have had an issue is if all of a sudden we're making up yeah. some core value that, that's, that's not anything you know, yeah. that had been right. important to us before. Um, but, uh, you know, sort of narrowing in and, and, and in some ways sort of prioritizing, um, what those values were. Yeah. Uh, I was fine with. Yeah. 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 And you said so you did have some younger partners that they were they around since the beginning or did they come along uh, years down the road? No, they came along yeah, okay. years down the road. Yeah, gotcha. so some of them. One of the partners was there from the second or third, you know, started a year or so after I started. But the, mm -hmm. the rest of them came in. Uh, yeah. yeah. Along the way. So OK, cool. And, uh, well, when did the IT transition happen. I mean, I, and I assume it came, it was birthed. I mean, uh, this might be a really bad assumption. So I'm going to say what my assumption is and you can correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of times you see companies 
you know, they, they add something else to their services because a client that they already have is asking for it. Is that kind of what happened or did you just decide, Hey, we're going to get into it? Well, <clears throat> so, um, Oh my God, back in 2002, 2003, something like that. Sarbanes Oxley okay. hit the scene. Okay. And that was an area that was going to require, require a lot of consultants and so that was an area that we said hey this this dovetails well into the kind of work that we've been doing and so <clears throat> we started focusing on Sarbanes-Oxley consulting and a big piece of of Sarbanes-Oxley which is basically in case you you're not aware what that means that's where companies have somebody come in and their auditors assess their the internal controls around the company. This came out of Enron and some of those companies that failed because of their internal controls were not strong enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is something some of the cryptocurrencies might want to focus they on. Now. <laughs> um, and and so, you know, focusing on the internal controls. Well, obviously, IT systems are a huge Big piece of, of a company's accounting processes and procedures and all of that. And so there's a strong IT component to Sarbanes-Oxley. So we knew we needed to, to uh, have the skills to deal with the IT part. Well, Sarbanes-Oxley work, particularly back in the early days, was very seasonal, okay? The first couple of quarter, the, the, it's the second and third quarter of the year, there's not much going on with Sarbanes-Oxley. And so if you had IT resources, they're sitting around twiddling their thumbs mm. during half the year. And so, uh, you know, we said, well, we've got these, these IT resources. Is there something else we can have them be begin to focus on? And so that's how it got started. And, and, and then uh, we hired a, uh, a gentleman who eventually became a partner um, and uh, he was smart enough to folk the, the, the kinds of things we were trying to do back then from an IT perspective we were being marginally successful okay generating business doing that and and so he he brilliantly uh, after looking around at the world for a while, focused on NetSuite, yep, um, the, the, which was you know the new cloud ERP mm. uh, system, and said, "I think NetSuite's going to be big." Uh, and, and so we he was began right. <laughs> focusing on NetSuite, and it has been absolutely huge, uh, and 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 it is now. You know, IT used to be this much of our business. Uh, and it's now thirty or forty percent, or maybe even more. Wow, of, that's a significant shift. Yeah. And frankly, a more profitable. I was going to say it's got it's got to be more margin rich. Yeah. yeah, and 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 the margins are much better um, uh, around that that sweet practice. Yeah, and, and so Michael was was uh, you know. Yeah, that's huge. Knock on wood, wood yeah. that he was <laughs> he, he he was wise enough, and it took several years of investment on our part. To, to build up the expertise mm -hmm. and get going. And, but now it's just, you know, going gangbusters. Yeah. That's really great. Great to hear. Well, this has been a fun conversation, uh, going back to, you know, starting a company, you had had two major recessions, dot com bust, 2008 subprime mortgage, whatever the heck that was. Yep. Uh, that was horrible. Uh, you know, had to build it up, successfully sold it, stayed on, uh, yeah, this is really, really fun. Well, uh, it's a good journey and I appreciate all of the, the info here that you've given us in the story. Absolutely. My pleasure. Hopefully it's, it's helpful to somebody. I think it is. I think a lot of people need to be thinking particularly about that succession plan. And, um, if we had more time, we could dive in, but nobody's going to listen past 45 minutes. So, we, <laughs> but I, I met a guy I'll, really quick. I met a guy who, uh, was a public speaker and he, his whole thing was talking to folks who are selling their company and helping them figure out the transition afterwards. Um, because a lot of folks end up selling, you know, sometimes they make a good sum of money, wonderful, but then their entire identity is gone. Like, well, I used to be in charge of, I mean, I was, I was leading 2000 people 
myself. And I felt that I'm like, well, who, the, who am I if I'm not in this role anymore? Um, and you know, so I, I'm curious just on a really quick, did you feel any of that yourself? Where you're like, you were in charge and now like, well, what am I doing? Or were you super ready to retire? <laughs> um, yes, I felt some of that, uh, particularly exacerbated, you know, cause my wife and I's retirement plan was play a lot of golf, do a lot of traveling. <laughs> and and, and then COVID. <laughs> for, for me personally, uh, I, I viewed a lot of my clients as friends yeah. and I wanted to continue main, you know, so I wanted to keep going to coffee with them or going to lunch with them. Mm -hmm. Well, COVID comes along two months after I retire yeah. and the country club closes. So there's no golf oh. travel comes to a screeching halt, obviously. And yep. then, you know, nobody wanted to go out and have coffee or have lunch. And, and so my wife came really, really close to picking up the phone and, calling my partners back and saying, you know, I don't care if you pay him, but find <laughs> him something, something for this guy to do and get them the hell out of my house. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, fortunately now things have normalized and, and, you know, the country club reopened yep, and sure. could go out and play golf and, and, you know, other things. Uh, and finally now the travel is, is, mm -hmm. is back where we can do that. <laughs> if the airlines but, can work. Yeah. If you can, you know, <laughs> not have a plane screw you up. But yeah, there, there was certainly, th there wasn't quite as much as I was worried I might have. Oh, that's good. Um, uh, uh, around that. And, and yeah, cause my identity had a lot, you know, was certainly wrapped up a whole lot in Bridgepoint consulting. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was, it was kind of my baby. Uh, but again, the, the going through the COVID change, you know, all of that kind of stuff, help to ease some of that that yearning or you know whatever yeah. for from my side of being back in there and i gotta solve some problems and yep. i gotta make some decisions and i you know i need to be emailing 65 people today or whatever yeah. it was so yeah we we actually sold at the end of 2020 covid oh. was really good for my industry but then the last two years i'm so glad i was not in that industry i mean it would have been just an uphill battle over and over and over again uh, with inflation and everything else, we would have been totally hosed. So yeah, that, that helped my transition as well. But it's interesting though, cause it was sort of the opposite. Yeah, it was yeah. the end of, not the end of COVID, but you know what I mean? End of 2020, which felt like things were really kind of normalizing a little bit depending yeah. on who you are, where you live. But yeah. Yep. Well, um, before we kind of go to the last section, is there anything that you want to plug any, any project you're working on or, or Bridgepoint as a company or, uh, any ideas that you want to just put out there in the ether? Well, you, you, you know, I, I, it's going to be fascinating. You know, a lot of companies are pushing people to get back in the office and all that kind of thing. And, and obviously I, I you know, I, I, I was the kind of person that I wanted to be in the, I wanted to be sure. with other people. And I, I sort of felt like I needed some physical separation between home and work. Yep. Uh, otherwise, it would have been really easy to just never stop because there was always stuff that needed to be done. Um, and, and, and it's going to be interesting to see the, the, the thing that I wonder about companies is, 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 is how do you build camaraderie and, and, and a sense of mm -hmm. team and what about all the informal communication that happens when you're walking down the hall in the office and you hear somebody talking about yeah. something or you're grabbing a coffee or a Coke and, and, and I, how, you know, certainly companies can hang together for a while. How long can they with, without, yeah. you know, but I've got a daughter-in-law that started with a company during COVID you know, went into the office for a couple of days, but, and I remember her saying one day that she felt like she was doing a pretty good job. She had a team that she was managing, you know, yeah. like she had a pretty good job building rapport with her team. And, and obviously the younger people are much more comfortable, uh, with all the, you know, 
different forms of communication Video chat and now, text yeah, and, yeah. And text and all of that and 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 feel more comfortable um again i was a walk in the office or let's go yep. sit in the conference room or you know and 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 solve this issue um uh you know before we leave the room kind of thing and and so it's going to be interesting to me to see yeah. how these companies can continue are you going. still like a pick up the phone and call somebody kind of guy yeah you although see? i'm more te- I, yeah. I do more a lot more texting nowadays have you ever I still <laughs> can't like yeah you can't you're not 100 miles 100 yeah. words a minute yeah have you ever witnessed because i have uh, like a younger generation person when their phone rings and they just panic because they don't know what to do. Have you seen this? I have not. It's no, fascinating. Yeah. Like I, it, it was a kind of a, a Gen Z generation and, I, and there's, I'm not knocking any, I mean, every generation's communication styles and preferences are different, but man, her phone rang and it was somebody she knew, but like she wasn't used to seeing her phone. Room. She just looked at it like, what do I do? And I'm just like, you could just, just slide the thing and answer it, you know? But she's like, I don't know how to talk on the phone. Uh, but I, and so I'm sure I have plenty of friends that I startle all the time because I just call them to catch up. I'm like, why is he calling me? Is the world crashing? Yeah. I just want to talk, you know? Well, I've got a, a 32 year old <laughs> son, and, you know, I'll say, hey, have you talked to some of your, you know, high school buddies and that kind of stuff? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 We talked last week. And, you know, you drill into it a little bit more. They didn't talk. No, they didn't. They talk. texted. <laughs> yeah. uh, what? Yep. How much communication? You know, how do you shoot the breeze? Sure, <laughs> in, sure. In a text and find out much information. Um, but it's a changing I, I, world, I, I, and I'm no, with it you. Is, it's it's going to be interesting I, to see. It was time for this old dog. <laughs> to, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be interesting to see how things unfold. I'm, I'm with you there. It's, it's, uh, it's fun to kind of watch from the outside, but. I also am in it as well. So it's, um, I get to be both right now as a yeah. consultant myself. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, well, so the last part of this, we have like a little quick fire. So five little questions. It's a this or a that. So I'll say a couple things and you just, you know, as quick as you can fire off, tell me which one. Okay. Just a fun way to end off the podcast. All okay. right. Here we go. First one, chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Delivery or dine-in? Dine-in. Bus or train? Or neither <laughs> I'd probably do bus. I mean, a train, excuse me. Television series or movie? Like if you're at home. Television series. Okay. And the last one, spend money or save money? You know, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm now at that point in life yep. <laughs> where it's a little bit more spend money. I thought that uh, might be the case. That's yeah, why I saved that know, one for last. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's been an interesting transition. And, 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 you know, one of the biggest shockers when you retire is you don't get a salary anymore. Yeah. And, and you know, you spend all your life sticking money over here in the bank not to ever touch it. And now all of a sudden. It's your only choice. You're touching it, and it's taken me several years uh, to to, to kind of come to grips with this. But my my wife finally kind of pushed me over the edge when she said, "Bob, we can fly first class, or our kids will be fly, flying first class." And I said, "You know what? We're going to start flying first class." <laughs> you know, that's when, awesome. when you put it in those kind of terms. Um, yeah, I'm ready to do some spending. Spoil you or spoil your kids? Yeah. You spoiled yeah. your kids for 20 years, yep. so you can yeah, spoil I set yourself them up now. fine. <laughs> now they're off. Well, again, Bob, this has been wonderful. Thanks so much for the great conversation. Uh, that's this is the end of the podcast. So, well, uh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. And again, I hope it might be beneficial. Oh, to it somebody certainly will be. Yeah. All so. right. Uh, Work culture podcast signing off. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.